Hi everybody and welcome to this afternoon's second session where we'll be finding out, out all about Europe's largest science of fossil fuels and what's been going on there. And your host uh, is again um, JC Bingler and I hope you enjoy this session. Thank you so much for introducing me and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for those of you who didn't join the previous webinar, my name is JC. Um, I'm with the NGO Urgewald and I will be your host for this session. We actually have two more webinars coming up today. This one right now is about Barclays fossil business and a related case study and the one after is about the practicalities of getting to carbon zero. In this session about Barclays, we will be hearing from Nicole Campena at Urgewald first, and then Melinda Yankee, environmental lawyer and activist focusing on oil and gas developments. And just like in the previous session, which you can see on YouTube in case you should have missed it, we will be talking about the bank itself first and then give you an example of a fossil fuel project they're financing. So Nicole will talk about Barclays as a bank and then Melinda will talk about a massive oil and gas extraction project off the coast of Guyana. ExxonMobil is the oil company leading the drilling in that project and Barclays is one of the leading investors in Exxon, which makes this a very interesting case study for today's session. And I would like to strongly encourage you to submit your questions either via the Zoom chat or on social media as you think of them during the talk. So you don't have to wait until the talks are over. If you think of any questions you would like to ask either of the uh, speakers, type them into the chat and we will collect them throughout the talk and ask them after the presentations. And with that, I would like to hand over to the speakers. Thanks a lot, JC. I'm gonna start with sharing my screen. If it works, there we go. All right, so as JC's already said, my name's Nicole and I'm gonna give you a quick introduction into Barclays. And let's jump right into it and look at some general information about Barclays. So Barclays is the second largest British bank after HSBC, and they make most of their money in the UK and the US. And wherever you look, you will find that they pride themselves on the diversification of their business. So that means that they do private banking, corporate banking and investment banking. But essentially they are an investment bank they have, an, they have an appetite for high risk deals. They do lots of credit card business. So that most of you probably remember Barclay card and that is all high risk. And if you wanted to compare Barclays to a different European bank, you could probably compare them to Deutsche Bank. Let's look at Barclays from a different angle because Barclays is indeed a bank in crisis. Barclays has lost 50% of its market value within the first four months of this year. On New Year's Eve in 2019, they were worth 41 billion US dollars. And now their market value is down to 21 billion US dollars. Reasons for that are incredibly complex. And I try to break it down. So I'd say the main reasons are that we currently have very low interest rates. Brexit is leading to quite a lot of insecurity and we have a global recession and the Corona crisis isn't improving that situation. Moreover, Barclays is also an investor in many energy companies and energy prices have been falling for the last 10 years on the stock market. And that's a very interesting situation in general because in that time when Barclays, no, sorry, when energy prices continued to fall, most other stocks went up. And for example, the Apple stock skyrocketed. And again, the Corona crisis is not improving the situation. Corona, most of you have probably seen newspaper articles like this one, this one's from The Guardian from last week. And basically Corona is leading to a massive drop in demand for energy. And that also influences, or that leads to crashing energy prices. Of course, that's really bad for energy companies, but that's also bad for Barclays as a bank that's invested in those energy companies. But apart from that, Barclays also has a problem of, let's say, a different nature, and that's actually their CEO, Jess Daly. 
He came to Barclays in 2015, and before that, he was the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, a American bank. And when you Google Jess Daly's name, the first thing that you will find below his Wikipedia article is this BBC article from February titling Barclays boss Jess Daly deeply regrets sex offender link. Let's go through it chronologically. In 2017, Jess Daly fell for an email prank by a disgruntled customer who was basically pretending to be Staley's boss with a Gmail address and Staley fell for it and they exchanged a few email emails before it came out. One year later, Staley tried to unmask an internal whistleblower who was trying to voice concerns about executives. And for that, Staley had to, had to pay a fine of over 600,000 pounds. And last year, this is what you might have heard somewhere, an investigation in his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein started. Jeffrey Epstein is a convicted sex offender and he's been charged with sex trafficking of underage girls. And they became friends when Staley was still working at JP Morgan Chase. And apparently that relationship kind of cooled off when, when Staley went to Barclays, but it never completely ended. So looking at these issues, it's not really surprising that there are rumors out there that Barclays is likely to have a new CEO sooner or later. But let's look at the reason why we're all here. Let's look at Barclays investments in fossil fuels. Barclays is Europe's largest financer of the fossil fuel industry. It's pumped 118 billion US dollars into the industry since the Paris Agreement. And it's actually increased its investment since 2018. With that, Barclays is leading as the worst European bank with a margin of 36%. Not only is Barclays the worst European financer of the entire industry, but it's also the largest European financer of fossil fuel expansionists. And expansionists are companies that are, for example, planning to build new coal power plants. And to give you an example of companies that Barclays finances, BP, Shell and Exxon are probably quite well known. Adani might be. They have been facing a massive backlash against their plans to build a new to build the largest coal mine in the world in Australia. RWE is Europe's largest carbon emitter. NTPC is the world's number one coal plant developer. And Fortum is planning to take a new coal power plant online in Germany this year. And that would be the only new coal power plant in Western Europe. So how do we get Barclays out of those companies? One of the most straightforward ways to do this is to push Barclays to adopt a good sustainability policy. Nowadays, basically every bank has some kind of sustainability policy and it always comes down to the nitty gritty details. Barclays came out with a new policy just a few weeks ago and it definitely needs improvement. But in order for us to criticize it properly, we need to know what it says. So let's look at that. Barclays has adopted an immediate exclusion of companies deriving over 50% of their revenues from coal, and they will lower that threshold to 30% in 2025 and to 10% in 2030. That sounds great, doesn't it? However, there's a major loophole integrated into this policy that allows Barclays to continue financing all the major European utilities companies as well as over 200 coal power plants, coal companies, sorry. And that is simply because Barclays is using the wrong metric. So many companies generate over 50% of their energy from coal, but they, de but they derive less than 50% of their revenue from coal. Let me give you an example for this. So let's look at a fictional company that is active in many different sectors. Let's say it's active, it's selling products in, I don't know, a department store. It also is active in the infrastructure sector and it's also operating coal power plants. Obviously, if 
the company is active in so many different sectors, all of those individual sectors will only make up a tiny share of the entire revenue of the company. And therefore, that company will probably still be able to receive financing from Barclays, although the coal share of power generation um, might even be higher than 50% of that fictional company. Apart from that, Barclays policy is generally too slow and not ambitious enough. The IPCC says that Europe needs to be out of coal by 2030. The thing is, by 2030, Barclays can still finance companies with a 10% coal share of revenue. And that is not aligned with what the IPCC says, because that means that Barclays can finance companies with some kind of a coal business. Moreover, other European banks have been much more determined to actually phase out coal. So for example, IMG, which is the largest bank in the Netherlands, they came out in 2017 saying that by 2025, they will only finance companies with a coal share of power production below 5%. And although even ING's policy is lacking in a few points, it just shows how unambitious Barclays policy is because by the time that ING will go down to 5%, Barclays will go down to 30%. But I don't only want to talk about coal. Let's, for example, look at oil sands. So Barclays is kindly asking companies that are active in that sector to reduce their carbon footprint. That is far from enough because it doesn't force the companies to change their business model and it doesn't force Barclays out of those companies. Moreover, in Europe, Barclays now excludes fracking projects according to the policy. That's absolutely great. But the thing is that most projects are located in the US or Argentina. And there's no exclusion criteria for those two countries. So overall, there's absolutely no need to celebrate that policy. But in my opinion, there's rather a need to finally, once and for all, push Barclays out of fossils together. And I believe that's possible because of three reasons. Barclays has faced protests for years now. Most of you probably remember some kind of protest against Barclays that you've seen either in the media, on social media, or maybe even in front of a branch. And second, Barclays is in crisis. They are quite vulnerable right now. And last but not least, COP, the Global Climate Summit, will be in Glasgow. Whenever it's happening, it will be in Glasgow and it will have a special focus on the finance sector. And that means that all eyes will be on the big British banks, including Barclays. And as soon as we get one of those banks to move, it's gonna be much easier for us to move all the other banks because they're always, they are always watching each other. And as soon as one bank moves out of fossil fuels, all the other ones are under pressure to do that too. And on that note, I'd like to end. If you've got any questions for me, please ask them in the comments below and um, we'll, be ask, we'll be answering them in the Q&A section afterwards. Now I'd like to hand over to Melinda. Good, thank you very much. Can, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to try and share my screen to start with. Yeah. Good. So good day. My name is Melinda Janke and I'm here to tell you about fossil fuels and financing. And I'll use the example of Guyana, which is a small South American country that's aiming to be a petro state just as oil prices have crashed. And I'll close by suggesting some actions that you can take to stop fossil fuels from destroying the earth. The key idea is to cut off the money supply. The I'm an international lawyer and an attorney at law, and I started my career as a commercial lawyer in the city of London. And I've worked in-house at BP, I've advised multinationals, and I've worked as a consultant for the World Bank, the IDB, and other international development agencies. And I've also done a lot of work for indigenous peoples and for the environment. I'm currently counsel on a case challenging oil production in Guyana, 
and the case is supported by the campaign A Fair Deal for Guyana, A Fair Deal for the Planet, and Fair Deal aims to make the government of Guyana and the oil companies obey the laws of Guyana and protect the environment for the present and future generations. So welcome to XR and friends and everyone who's here. Um, congratulations on the work that you're doing. Scientists say that the safe limit for greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is 350 parts per million. Today, we are over 400. There is no carbon budget. We could stop fossil fuels now and the earth will still get warmer because of the greenhouse effect. So this is a climate emergency and we must cut emissions to zero and take the excess greenhouse gases back down to 350 parts per million. And we have to stop putting money into fossil fuels. So XR's campaigning is vital and I was very happy to join you in Trafalgar Square last autumn. And from London to South America to Guyana, which is in the top next to Venezuela, and more than 80% of Guyana is forested. It's an Amazonian forest country. Guyana's forests take out more greenhouse gases than the Guyanese people produce, and it ought to be famous as a carbon sink, but it's not. Guyana has had decades of financial, political, and environmental mismanagement, and today Guyana has no legal government, only an illegitimate, unconstitutional, de facto administration. Even so, money is going into Guyana for oil and gas. The World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank are providing financing. And this, what's this money for? It's to help Guyana transition from a carbon sink to a carbon bomb. In 2015, ESSO, a subsidiary of ExxonMobil, announced that it had found oil. Since then, Guyana has become one of the biggest finds in the world. Current estimates are 13.6 billion barrels of oil and over 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Burning that would release about 7.5 gigatons of greenhouse gases. Guyana will go from a carbon sink to a carbon bomb if that happens. The money to do this comes from the commercial banks investing in oil and gas, and from international financial institutions lending Guyana money to prepare. The commercial banks are using your savings. The international financial institutions are using your taxes. So it's going to be up to you to stop them. This is the oil field. ESSO has more than 8 billion barrels of oil in Guyana. ExxonMobil's reserves at the end of 2019 about 22.4 billion barrels of oil, allowing for new finds in Guyana. It looks as though Guyana is roughly 25% of ExxonMobil's reserves. The oil field is 120 miles offshore, the ocean is a mile deep, and the petroleum deposit is about two miles below the seabed. This is very dangerous deep water drilling. Production started in December 2019 in Esso's Liza 1, just a few months ago and ESSO had to do an environmental impact assessment. The EIA and all documents are public because that's how I wrote the law in 1996. The EIA for LISA 1 says ESSO will dump 4,000 barrels of sewage into the ocean every day, and that this treated sewage will benefit marine mammals, turtles, fish, and so on. In other words, ESSO's EIA implies that endangered and rare whales and dolphins will be better off because ESSO puts in the water that they live in. LISA has about 1.4 billion barrels of oil, and over the 23 years of the project, the sewage would add up to about 1.4 billion gallons. So Guyana is getting roughly a gallon of sewage for about every barrel of oil that comes out. I turn now to the finances. The oil deal with ExxonMobil and its partners has been strongly criticized by the Guyanese people by the national press and by international experts. Even the IMF has criticized it. But the foreign press predicts vast wealth for Guyana and Global Witness has put out a report claiming that Guyana would get 168 billion based on an oil price of $65 a barrel for 40 years. And they said that Guyana could renegotiate with ExxonMobil 
for an additional 55 billion. Now that's complete nonsense, but some people believe it. And you can get an idea of the outside pressure on Guyana to do oil. Guyana gets paid in oil, not cash. For every hundred of barrels of oil, SO and the two partners can take 75 barrels for their costs and another 12 and a half barrels for their share. Guyana gets the remaining 12 and a half barrels and then has to hawk it on the world market. The de facto regime have no idea how to sell oil, so they have to pay someone to do it. Now that was bad enough, but today we have a COVID-19 pandemic. People don't need oil. The oil price has crashed. The world is running out of space to store this oil that nobody wants. Fossil fuels are cutting back. Some will go out of business. And as governments try to get the economy going again, fossil fuel companies are lobbying hard to get money. Are the oil majors too big to fail? No. The sad truth is that they are on the wrong side of history. The world is changing rapidly. We're moving to a world that is free of fossil fuels, a world of technological change, a world of electricity that is 100% renewable and cheap. You don't pay the sun to shine or the wind to blow. Fossil fuel companies and their investors want to hold back that progress. And the choice is stark, their survival or yours. The United Nations Environmental Programme said a few months ago that if all the Paris Agreement pledges are met, we are on track for three degrees for three degrees warming. Those pledges are not being met. We're on track for more than three degrees. The planet will become hostile to life, people and animals will die, the forests will burn, and the oceans will become more acid. Do not expect politicians to save the earth. They signed the Paris Agreement to limit the increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees, and that is already deadly. The oceans are getting hotter and more acid. We're losing coral reefs and the marine life that depends on them. Global leaders had no right to treat economic growth as if it's more important than the living ecosystems of this planet. Stopping the greenhouse effect is going to be up to you, and I want to offer three suggestions. First, cut off the money that is going to fossil fuels. The recent report, Banking on Climate Change, says that since 2016, 35 banks have invested $2.7 trillion in fossil fuels. That's $2.7 trillion to destroy the earth. If you have a bank account with one of those banks, some of that may well be your money. You can lobby your bank to change, or you can just move your bank account to another bank that doesn't invest in fossil fuels. If you have a pension fund, you can divest from fossil fuels. If you're a student, you can ask your schools and universities also to divest. Ask yourself, which oil company can make a profit when the oil price is below 35 US dollars? Probably not one of them. The international development banks like the World Bank and the IDB get money from your governments. You can lobby your governments to make sure your taxes go into protecting the earth, not, not destroying it. And you can cut off the money directly by spending differently. Plastic comes from the petrochemicals industry and is choking the oceans. Try not to buy it. What is your carbon footprint? Can you reduce it? Do you need a car or a bike? Can you switch to an envi a renewable environment energy supplier? Every little action counts. Millions of people doing something small still has a very big impact. Secondly, make the fossil fuel companies pay to take out the greenhouse gases. Nick Stern said in the economics of climate change, climate change is the biggest market failure the world has ever seen, and it interacts with other market perfections. The time to correct market failure is long overdue. We are in a climate emergency. Fossil fuels have made vast amounts of money by causing the greenhouse effect. Now is the time to impose a climate emergency tax on fossil fuels. Every single dollar available for dividends must now go to protect ecosystems and forests to remove fossil fuels. 
Third, spread the message about Guyana. Tell others about this wonderful rainforest nation whose leaders want to be a petrostate even as the oil price dives. Tell people about, the, about Guyana, the carbon sink that could become a carbon bomb that destroys efforts to halt the greenhouse catastrophe. And spread the word about this little South American nation where some people are fighting against big oil in order to get a fair deal for the planet, a fair deal for Guyana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, we already got a first question for you. So if you would like to stay uh, unmuted, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. How much debt and cleanup do you expect the Guyanese people to be stuck with, all told? So that's an absolutely wonderful question. It's also a really tough question. And it, a lot of it depends on what happens. I think that most of Guyana's petroleum deposits are now stranded fossil fuel assets or on their way to becoming stranded fossil fuel assets. And the return is going to be very low if you look at the, at the oil price now. And Guyana has been borrowing money and to get to prepare for oil. For example, it's already borrowed about 55 million US dollars from the World Bank, and it's borrowed, um, I've forgotten how much more, but more millions from the IDB. And there has also been money spent from the national budget. So before um, we get anywhere, again, is already uh, hugely in debt. Now, the cleanup is, an, is, a, is another very good question, and that really depends on what happens. As I've mentioned, there's already damage to the environment from the sewage that's going in. There's also damage from the ballast that's coming. There's damage from um, emissions and so on. None of those things have been priced into the deal. So these are all being treated as externalities. In addition, if there is a spill or a well blowout, that could cost billions. I think everyone can remember the Macondo well blowout, which caused the deep water rig explosion in the Gulf. And I think the last figure that I saw was that cost BP about 60 billion. So it's huge. Um, and Guyana's uh, GDP per capita is about 4,000 US dollars a year. So we're talking about almost two different scales here. Thank you, Melinda. And just another uh, reminder, you can type your questions either directly into the Zoom chat or on social media. I have a question for um, either of you, but I think maybe Nicole or Heffa might be able to answer it. What kind of policy would it take to keep a bank like Barclays, who's invested in Exxon, who's leading the drilling off the coast of Guyana, what would it take a bank from, uh, to, what would it take to stop a bank from being able to finance oil companies such as Exxon? I think that's a really good question for Heffa because that really goes into nitty gritty details. I think the first place that banks need to start is to stop expansion projects of oil and gas companies. So that means no more new oil pipelines, no LNG terminals, and no development of new upstream um, oil and gas fields. And that's exactly, I mean, this stopping the expansion of oil, of, of, of companies <clears throat> from the oil and gas industry would be the most important step in that regard. Thank you. There's another question for Melinda. Um, is there a greater risk of spill or blowout because it's a deep water well? Yes, there is. Um, this is extremely dangerous. The petroleum is under very high pressure and the regulation, the enforcement of the environmental regulations in Guyana is not that strong. So for example, the first environmental permit that was issued to ESSO for the LISA-1 um, development 
says that ESO should use a blow-up preventer. Now, of course, that's nowhere near a good enough requirement. Uh, Guyana also doesn't have the um, ability to monitor what's going on, to check what's going on, and therefore has to rely on ESO in really entirely to know what's happening. Guyana has absolutely no technology to deal with deep water drilling. So I think it's a, it is an enormous risk and people are simply not aware of just how serious the risks are, not just to Guyana, but to the Caribbean. And if you go and look at the maps, you will see that for um, a spill of 600,000 barrels, um, that's not a particular, that's not a very big spill, uh, that there is already uh, damage to Trinidad and the Caribbean islands and further afield. Um, and Guyana could be left with some enormous cleanup costs. So it's a very, very risky, dangerous um, activity for which Guyana appears to be getting very little in the way of benefit. Thank you, Melinda. The next question, I think, um, is probably for Nicole and Hefa. And for those of you who should be wondering who Hefa is, she spoke earlier this week. She's the director of Urgewald. And for those of you who missed her presentation, it should be online on um, YouTube. So you can have a look at it. And yeah, I think either, either Nicole or Hefa um, can maybe answer the next question. It was typed here in the Zoom chat and it's a bit longer. I'm going to rephrase it and shorten it. Um, it's about what we can do more. And I think there are two parts. One of them is how can we threaten the banks more? Um, and how can we affect the people who work there, their brand, the leadership, etc. And I would like to add to that, what to experience do people working for these banks really have an understanding of the impact of the bank's portfolio of projects like the one in Guyana? I think what we really need to work on is, is increase people's understanding within the banks about the climate crisis, because many people in banks just don't know what the institution they work for is funding. And therefore, when you tell them, they might be absolutely shocked. And I think it's really powerful, therefore, to have protests in front of branches with facts, as soon as you have fact-based information at protests, it's very hard for people to look away. And also what I think is really powerful is sending letters to your bank branch, because as soon as one person sends a letter, they will know that at least 300 people had the same thought, but just couldn't be bothered to write a letter or an email. And if you send that to not the CEO, but maybe just the person who is in the branch that you have your bank account with, that's, that makes a difference because that's just a normal employee that might just not know about this. And we currently also have email actions going on where we're sending emails to the sustainability people because sometimes sustainability people actually want people to protest in front of branches organize some kind of protest, just because as soon as there's protest, sustainability people within a bank have something they can go to, like to the other people in the bank and say, hey, we need to really divest from coal, for example, because people want us to do this. They have something to push or poke people in the bank with. I don't know, Hefa, do you wanna add anything to this? Yeah, I would encourage people not to just silently change their bank account, but instead to make it a process. If you have friends who are at the same bank, become a group. Tell the bank that you want a discussion with them about <clears throat> their investments in fossil fuels and that you want a different policy. Threaten to change your account first. And um, when you change your account, um, you know, do it, do it like publicly combine it with a you know cut through your credit card in front of the bank um, combine it with a customer's uh, with an action together with other ex-customers of that bank that may that has a lot more impact um, that way if you make it a process rather than just doing it silently overnight what banks are really most afraid of is um, that their reputation is tarnished 
And for climate activists, banks are actually a really powerful lever to try and influence the climate crisis. It's a lot easier to get a bank to stop financing fossil fuels than it is to get fossil fuel companies to um, turn into different types of companies. And um, I think the point in the question is also very good about um, sort of um, how, uh, of looking at also other ways of trying to influence people working at banks. Look at, if you're in LinkedIn, you can contact people who work at um, individual UK banks directly and ask them about the fossil fuel investments and why are they not changing. The other thing is <clears throat> also for people who uh, maybe don't even have a bank account yet or, uh, um, or our students to write to the bank and say, this is why I'm never going to open up an account with Barclays until you change this. Even if you don't have an account with a bank, you, you have power. And uh, it's important for us to use this power and to use it now, because otherwise we're going to see a lot more Guyanas coming up. Thanks. Thank you um, very much, you too. Um, just because Jack reminded me, so the uh, recordings of previous talks are on the Facebook page, um, all the live stream talks are available there. Um, and just referring to Nicole's point about protests outside of branches, um, we're going to talk about how you can organize digital protests um, in the times of the pandemic this Friday. So if you should be interested in more ideas on how to do that, please join our talk on Friday evening. Um, another question for Melinda, probably, but I think maybe all three of you can, can answer it, is should we be pushing more actively for an ecocide law as a powerful deterrent to CEOs investing in fossil fuels? Um, oh, should I start? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are arguments for and against. The first thing is that if you're going to push for a law um, on on ecocide, it's really important to get the right definition of what ecocide means. The current definition is extensive loss or damage or destruction of ecosystems of a given territory, whether by human agency or other causes, to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory has been or will be severely diminished. There are two problems with that. One, um, human agency is fine because that's the problem. By other causes, it needs to come out because you can't really say that if something's been caused by an eruption of a volcano or na any natural cause cannot be ecocide. Secondly, it's limited to the enjoyment of the inhabitants of the territory. And so that is completely anthropocentric and doesn't in fact capture the real problem, which is the damage to ecosystems and the natural world. So I think that there are there would need to be a lot of work that's that's done on the definition of ecocide, and the second thing it would be important to have some some evidence that it would act as a deterrent, because we want to stop we want to stop it. We don't actually want a crime that's then punished because by then it's too late. The damage has already been done. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Melinda. The next question um, is from Facebook, or it came from, from uh, Facebook, I presume. And I think it would be good uh, to be answered by either Nicole or Heffa. And it is, are there any banks now that are not invested in fossil fuels? No, <laughs> except for ethical banks. Um, otherwise, um, if you look at um, the world's largest banks, all the big banks in, U in the UK, they are all heavily invested in fossil fuels. What we do see though is that part of the fossil fuel sector is losing a lot of investment and that is especially the coal industry. And that's because many large banks and large investors have begun banning coal power companies, coal mining companies, and companies that are either planning new coal mines or new coal power plants from their portfolios. But the most ambitious um, uh, investors and banks in this regard, they're not in the UK. 
you'll find them in France, you'll find them in Norway, where uh, there's been a, 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 real, a really steep drop in financing of the coal industry. In France, for example, <clears throat> um, there are some French investors that basically have taken the step to divest the entire coal industry. In Norway, you have um, a pension funds and uh, financial services providers that are getting out of the coal industry, some already for 2020, others by 2025. And uh, we're not seeing this type of action in the UK yet. And I believe it's simply because it will take more pressure on financial institutions. Speaking of pressure, and Nicole already shared the details of Barclays sustainability policy, there's a question about what led to Barclays implementing said policy in 2015, as far as you can tell? Did they do it of their own accord or was it following pressure from somewhere? Did they want to have a good policy to show for themselves ahead of COP21? And maybe um, that can also lead us to COP26. To be honest, I'm not aware what led to implementing their 2015 policy. Um, but considering that their climate policy that they came out with this year isn't great either, um, I don't think there were any strong beliefs to stop climate change behind that. I mean, maybe just to add on, we're going to have a webinar tomorrow where we talk exactly about what is a good fossil fuel policy for a bank and which are the banks that already have the best policies. Even on oil and gas, I want to add BNP Paribas, for example, which is um, one of the largest banks in the world. Um, they have, um, actually let have an, a policy where there are large parts of the oil industry that they have begun to exclude from their portfolio. For example, the entire fracking sector, not only in the US, but throughout the world. Excellent, thank you very much. Um... I think one of the last questions I would like to ask, um, and maybe this is something Nicole could answer, um, because we heard about HSBC in the previous talk, and now you told us a bit about Barclays. If you compare the two banks, um, also where they have most of their customers, which if you wanted to run a social media campaign to um, get their customers to question whether it's a good idea for them to be with either HSBC or Barclays, where would you focus your efforts on. Can you tell us a bit more about um, Barclays in that regard, maybe also in comparison to the other UK banks? So where I'd focus my efforts on regarding a campaign against Barclays? Or also where it would hurt them the most? Um, do they have most of their customers in the UK or is it outside of the UK? Yeah, so they have most of their customers in the UK. As I said, their main business is in the UK and the US. Um, but I, I suppose most of the viewers here are in the UK, so I'm going to focus on the UK. And in the UK, I mean, many people have their bank accounts with Barclays, although that's not their main business. And therefore, I think having protests in front of their branches, having protests online, commenting with hard facts on their social media posts now that we can't go outside would really hurt them because. Barclays already has quite a bad reputation in society. And if you would ask people on the streets what the worst, worst climate bank is in the UK, they would probably say Barclays. So I think it really needs a final really, really hard push to actually get them, do, get them to do something. And I think that pressure needs to come from all sides, but especially it needs to put their reputation at risk. And I mean, right now we can really only do that on social media. As Stacey has already said, um, I think we're gonna have a webinar on that on Friday, where we're all we're gonna talk everything about activism online. Um, let's talk past Corona era. So when we can go on the streets again. Um, I think protests in front of the branches 
find out when will there be a meeting where they, where they invite shareholders, for example. It doesn't have to be the shareholder meeting, but you know if there's like a big roadshow or something, can you organize a protest in front of that? Can you inform people who are shareholders of Barclays? Can you, I mean, obviously you should do, or you could do a protest in front of their annual general meeting, but that's only once a year. But that's also a great place where you could inform shareholders. I think it all comes down to informing shareholders and informing potential customers of Barclays. Because as soon as you take away their customers, Barclays will have to do something. Brilliant. I think um, these are very good words to wrap this session up with um, because we've run out of time. Thank you so much to everyone who's been speaking today. If you feel comfortable with that, um, would you mind leaving your email addresses or contact uh, details if people have more questions um, in the chat box? Um, also, we are going to have more talks this week. There's going to be one in 30 minutes right after this one, basically, and it's going to be um, about getting to carbon zero. Then tomorrow we'll have another presentation on Standard Chartered, which is the third bank in the UK bank series um, we're doing. And then afterwards, um, Hefa is going to speak about how to move banks to adopt the policies we actually want to see. And if you would like to know even more about the webinars that are happening later this week, you can find all the information on the Extinction Rebellion homepage by clicking on the Learn Together banner and obviously also on their social media channels. Um, stay tuned for the webinar coming up on Friday on digital action. Um, you can watch any of the uh, presentations that have already happened online. And I will say goodbye as a host for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you on Friday. Thank you so much, everyone.